Some advice for taking advice, right? As founders, we get a lot of different advice from lots of different people. Most of it's not very valuable. Some of it is, some of it are gems, but that's the problem. You get a lot of advice and the quality is very variable. That's the biggest problem with advice. So when we think about how to take advice, there's basically four ways of thinking about it. The first thing you gotta think of is who's in your network. The second thing is to manage your own psychology and the psychology of your advisors. And the third thing is just actually thinking through what sort of decisions are you trying to make? Because where you get your advice, who you get it from actually matters depending on the decisions you're trying to make. And the fourth thing, of course, is learning to have good judgment about what advice is good and what isn't going to be good for your situation. So mapping out your network of the people giving you advice. The way I like to think about it is it breaks down into four different categories. The first one, of course, is you. We often forget this, but you have instinct. You have a sense of how things and a gut about how things are going to go. That's why people have invested in you. That's why you are leading this company. Always remember to go back to what your own instincts are. You're going to get a lot of advice. It's going to be chaotic. It'll all be different but go back to how you feel about it. So don't forget that you are your best advisor to begin with. The second group around you is gonna be what we call the inner circle. And this is gonna be three to five people who you repeatedly talk to. These could be board members, investors, or advisors that have equity in your company. Most of these people actually have equity in your company because they're the ones who are gonna be engaged and they're the ones who have skin in the game just the same way you do. And you're gonna to talk to them frequently, could be weekly to bounce ideas off of them. And this is your inner circle. Some of your advisors might actually be tough on you. And that's okay, as long as you feel comfortable with them. And some of these advisors might know each other and some might not. They don't need to all trust each other or like each other. You just need to trust and like each of them. And remember, you have to very carefully curate this because as we've said, you're only as good as the five people closest to you. Be careful and ruthless about who you bring into that inner circle and, and really check if they're not in the 90th percentile of advisors and giving good quality advice, then you probably don't have the type of advisor network you need and you need to upgrade. And when you're looking for these very top advisors to bring into your inner circle, look for a bunch of things. They've probably been CEOs or operators in the past and have been in your shoes. Number two, other CEOs probably say something like, they're the best advisor I've ever had. That's another indication. Number three, They've probably got some domain expertise in the sector you're in, or at least in the type of business that you're running, even if they don't have experience in your sector. They typically possess a network of other top people they can introduce you to. They're typically humble, and they typically are generally teachers. They explain things well. They care to explain things and take the time to do that. That personality type allows you to absorb the information better and actually take action on it. The next ring, of advisors is what we call the quarterly group. So the quarterly group is typically about six people who you speak to once a quarter. And if you speak to them more frequently than that, you're probably spending too much time. If you speak to them less, they don't know enough about your business to actually give you good advice. And these are typically CEOs, people with deep expertise in your sector or business model. And often they're actually personal mentors of yours. Some of these folks come and actually can speak to you about what you're going through as a, as a founder, to upgrade your psychology, to upgrade your leadership. It might not have to do exactly with the business, but have to do more with you and your team. So the fourth ring of advisors is what we call the infrequent advisors. And this is gonna be about 15 people. And this group is about 15 people that might have equity, might not, but you go to them quite infrequently about very specific things you're looking at, whether it's finance or whether it's legal or whether it's the product or whether it's viral growth or digital marketing. There are certain people that have expertise that you need infrequently, but when they give you that expertise, it gives you a big boost in, in knowledge and your approach to what you're trying to do. Now, outside these four rings of advisors, there are what we call edge nodes. And this gets back to the strength of weak ties. These are people that you don't see regularly. They aren't necessarily from your industry, but they might say something that gives you a breakthrough idea. And they are outside your typical advisor network. Okay, so number two, and what we need to manage about advice is psychology. Your psychology and the psychology of the advice givers. When you get advice, you are going to have a lot of cognitive biases about what advice you like. Things that feed your ego, you're gonna like that advice better. Things that were the most recent, the things that you heard most recently, you're gonna favor those things. Or you might favor the advice that came in first. 
You're going to favor advice that helps you avoid difficult conversations, things that are awkward for you. You're going to favor advice that comes from people that you and your team favor. You're going to favor advice that comes from people who deliver it in a style that you favor. And of course, the big one, you're going to favor advice that already confirms what you started to believe earlier. Okay, now all of these biases and probably more end up affecting your own psychology about how you're interpreting advice and then deciding to implement advice. You just need to be aware of that and you need to manage for that. The other thing to watch, of course, is the psychology of the people giving you advice. You have to manage that as well. They're going to project their own experiences on you. They're going to project their own personality on you. They're going to project their own time on you. Let's say they were doing something 10 years ago and they think it's still relevant today because that's what they learned when they were doing your job. They're going to project their own situation. Let's say they're investing with a Series C venture firm now. They're going to project their own needs and their old worldview onto where you are now and it might not fit. They're going to be overly protective of you. A lot of the people giving you the advice are going to say things like, oh, you should be mad or you deserve better. They're not actually giving you advice. They're actually just supporting you emotionally and you're going to interpret it as advice to go to a lawsuit or something. And that's not great advice. That's just supporting you. You need to find the difference in the psychology between you and your advisor on that. Your advisors are going to end up giving you group think. So if everyone's scared about something in the markets today, that's the way they're going to be thinking this month and that's the advice he'll give you. The group think can invade all of your advisors as well. And of course, they're going to have sometimes difficulty empathizing with your customer or empathizing with your team or with your co-founder or with other investors who are investing at different stages. They won't actually understand the feelings of the people that you're trying to interact with and they're going to give you advice that's going to break those relationships. Now, most advisors really do want to give you the best advice. It is they're, they're trying their level best, but we are all hobbled by our psychology. So be aware of that and just manage for that for both yourself and the advisors. So one of the biggest things that we learned running our own companies is that you have to actively ask for negative or critical advice. Most people have learned not to give negative or critical advice because of the reaction of the person on the other side of the table, meaning you, the CEO. And so you have to ask them for it. And anyone who's willing to give it to you is gold because that's where you're going to see your blind spots. That's where you have your best chance to improve. So the third thing to think about when thinking about advice is what types of decisions you're trying to make. Are you trying to make a small tactical decision or you're trying to make a big decision? And of those big decisions is something reversible or is something irreversible? Now, in either case, whether it's a big decision or a tactical decision, you've got to focus on speed and making a decision. Everyone on your team is waiting for you to make the decision. Your board is waiting for you to make a decision. The market's waiting for you to make a decision. So if it's small and tactical, figure out how to make the decision quickly. Either delegate it, ask quick advice from your advisors on these tactical matters, and then let the people who are going to be affected by that tactical decision be very involved with the decision or make it themselves. That's how you speed up that decision and make those decisions quickly. And if it's a big decision, decide is this reversible or is this irreversible? And in either case, you're going to want to go out and get your advice. Probably make that a decision when you only have about 70% of the information and then just communicate it well. As my old mentor, Dennis Hightower said, there's 13 ways of doing anything. 11 of them will work. Just pick one and go for it. So don't be too precious about which advice you take. It's not always the case that there's a right answer or wrong answer but rather picking a good plan and then prosecuting it strongly is probably the best way to go. And the last thing is about judgment. Developing your own sense about what is good and bad advice. Now, the way I think about it is there's four ways of you, you're either going to be getting good advice or you're going to be getting bad advice and you're going to be getting advice that you like and you're going to be getting advice that you don't like. And if you look at the chart that way, good advice from somebody delivered in a way that you like is the optimum. That's very, that's, that's what you want to be. That's not usually what happens. Often your good advice is coming from people you don't like or it's not advice, advice that you like. It makes you awkward or it doesn't help your ego or whatever. And when you don't like it, you still have to accept it because it's the right advice. And you have to learn that skill of recognizing it's the right advice and taking the course of action that you should, even though it doesn't feel good necessarily or doesn't fit with your own psychology. Then you're going to be getting a lot of bad advice and you, you're taking it from people that you like. This is the big problem because this is where you end up with a lot of bad decisions. You like the person, you like the way they're delivering it, but it's actually bad advice and you'll take it and then you go down the wrong road. And then of course, if you're getting bad advice from people you don't like, that's pretty easy to deal with as well. You just sort of reject it. When I think about what, where the advice is coming from and how I'm receiving it, this matrix helps me sort through what might be good or bad advice. So the magic is the combination of your network and your own psychology 
and that makes it greater than the sum of its parts.